before we get to 1 Chronicles 12, let me just, uh, verse 32, let me just preface this by saying it's about the sons of Issachar. It's a familiar verse, but the Issachar was one of the 12 sons of Jacob, so it's one of the 12 tribes of Israel. And uh, Issachar himself had four sons, and from those descendants, he, or from those sons, he had 22,600 descendants in his tribe who were all mighty men of valor. So these were the, these were the warriors of the tribe, 22,600 sons of Issachar, if you will. And uh, they knew how to fight. And so what's happening in 1 Chronicles 12 is that there's scriptures listing the warriors that were joining David in the fight. And the sons of Issachar, you know, the Holy Spirit makes comments on each tribe. And um, so they were going to help David take back the kingdom. And so it says of, in 1 Chronicles 12, 32, of the sons of Issachar, men who understood the times, that's first, they understood the times. So they had a prophetic sense of what season they were in. All right? That men who understood the times, that's number one. And with knowledge of what Israel should do. So they had the application. So they didn't just have revelation, they had the application. You guys get me? So there's revelation, interpretation, application. And the sons of Issachar had all three. They, they heard from God. They knew what was going on, and they knew how to apply it. They knew what it meant, and they knew how to apply it in that moment. And that's actually key because some people have revelation, but they don't have any application. They don't know, you know, I had a dream and they tell their friend, but they don't know what it means. They don't know how to apply it. So they have part of the deal. But to have the whole deal is amazing. And all of them got it. The sons of Issachar had this characteristic that the Bible says they understood the times and they knew what Israel should do. Now, the good news is that what was unique about the sons of Issachar is available to all of us because we are children of God, because we have the Holy Spirit, and because all of the sons and daughters of God are led by God. How many know in, in uh, Romans 8 it says, all those who are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons and daughters. One of the characteristics of being a son or a daughter is being led by God. So if you believe that it's hard to hear God, if you believe that it's you know, God's playing games with you or he's hiding from you, that's not the characteristic of a son or daughter. That's an orphan heart. And I want to encourage you to abandon that thinking and to wrap your mind around the fact that God loves to lead you. He's happy to lead you. Yes, there are some bumps and some mysteries, but for the most part, it says don't be drunk with wine, Ephesians 9.18, but understand what the will of the Lord is. In other words, it's meant for us to have a continual understanding of God's plan for our lives. It's not, that's not unique and exceptional, that's meant to be normal and normative for the sons and daughters of God. It's appropriate for us to, you know, Jesus said, my sheep, they hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. So a lot of that is literally mindset. Now I know some of you are like, no, no, God hasn't spoke, I know, but I'm going to tell you something. There's a secret that you just need to know. Stop saying that, seriously, and stop believing that. And start saying and believing, my God loves me, he absolutely wants to lead me, and he is speaking. Amen. Job 33 says, God is speaking, though men and women may not perceive it. So that the problem's not on his end. He's happy to speak to us. And for most of the time, we need to be able to hear God. There are exceptions. There are times where he tests us. There are times where there's unusual warfare. And in those times, we just stand. You know, we don't know what's going on, so we just stand. But that ought not to be our continual lifestyle. Our continual lifestyle is to be led. You know, it says he led them forth in peace. And so I want to encourage you, a lot of the difference between those who know what I'm saying and those who don't believe it are, is your faith level. Like, if you believe in a God that loves you enough to lead you, that's going to be your experience. If you believe in a God who's playing games with you, who really doesn't have your best interest in mind, that's going to be your experience. Jesus said in many occasions, he said, according to your faith, be it done to you. And so we need to believe that God is good and he's good enough to lead us and he's good enough to keep his promises because he made crazy promises about, you know, what about uh, James 1.5? If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God and he will give to him generously and without reproach. So he, that means he's going to give us the wisdom we need and without making us feel bad for asking. So we never need to be apologetic about needing the wisdom of God. But then the next verse says, but let him ask in faith. Because the person who wavers, who's indecisive, who's not sure, is like the wind and the waves of the ocean. And it's like when you look at a storm and you just see everything tossing and, and there's white water and you're thinking, this isn't surfable, this, there's not, it's just murky and choppy. That's what it's like to be indecisive about whether God's speaking or not. And the number one, I've said this before, but one of the number one 
search engine requests in Google is by Christians asking, what is the will of God? So we're asking Google, <laughs> but the Lord has the answer for us, and he wants to tell us his will. And I really believe that when I've, when I've gotten frantic about the will of God, when I've started to not hear God, I've adopted a mindset that he doesn't want to speak to me and that I'm the exception to the rule and that somehow I made some mistake along the way, which, by the way, everyone has. You've all disqualified yourself from hearing God if it's up to you. If God's rewarding you according to your own righteousness, then none of you can hear God and neither can I. But if by grace we're saved, by grace we become strong. There's grace to be saved. Some of us have enough grace to be saved, but not enough grace to be strong. It says in 2 Timothy 1, 2, 1, be strong, therefore, in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Be strong in the grace. It takes grace to be saved. It takes more grace to be strong. And being strong means hearing the voice of God and obeying the voice of God. Now, there is one caveat in all this, and that is that sometimes we hear God and we choose not to obey him, and sometimes God becomes a little quiet to get our attention, so we figure out, where did we go off the road here? You know, where did we? And, and, and of course, Isaiah promises that if we get off the road, there's a little voice behind us that'll say, hey, this is the way, walk in it, meaning this is where you took an exit. Just come back, and he'll always be faithful to tell us. So he's, again, he's not playing games. He actually wants to help us, but he does have to get our attention, and sometimes he gets our attention by just being quiet. Just, he's just not talking, and he's waiting for you and I to notice. But if we've adopted a mindset that he doesn't talk anyway, we won't notice. We'll just assume that's normal. But if he's not talking, that's not normal. Okay? So there needs to become a new normal, which is that he's speaking, he's communicating, and he loves me. And he's happy to lead me. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. So along those lines, it's important that we know what's coming, why it matters, and what we can do about that. So we're going to look at four areas uh, in this house. And if you're with us from Iris Leader School, this will be good for you for at least... Uh, some of it. If you can, some of our leader school students stick around, though, so it might be good for you for a while. Many of our staff and our, our interns are actually former Irish school students, so it's very interesting. So I want to just share with you, the first one is, of course, Irish leader school. Um, it's starting today. Tonight, this evening is orientation. Classes start tomorrow. And I want to read you, I don't know if you know this or not, but schools aren't just a cool thing to do. They're actually biblical. In Acts 19, 9 and 10, it says, As the hearts of the people listening in the temple became hard and disobedient, Paul withdrew with some disciples and taught them every day in the school of Tyrannus for a period of two years. So Paul conducted this two-year-long school. It, and here's, now listen, as a result, this is of the school in parentheses, as a result of the school, all those living in Asia heard the word of the Lord. So what was happening is Paul was teaching in the temple, which was the modern day church at that time it was the jewish believers who were going to church they had they had the buildings and they were so they're, they're they're in church but they're not getting it and their hearts were getting hard and paul was actually preaching the gospel to them and so he, his strategy shifted he felt the holy spirit say take some people that are already following me and start a school so he starts this school of tyrannus in another building and, and, and the word of the Lord exploded all through Asia because these students got it and they took off and they, shared, so they spread the gospel. So what's amazing about a school in a church, which is what we have, is that the church, the, 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 the church can, in, can host the school and the school can inspire the church. It's a win-win environment. It's a win-win culture, which is super awesome. So um, this school, by the way, was in Ephesus, which is modern-day Turkey. And the school was God's method for releasing passion, uh, well-trained disciples, and we're asking God to do that with our school. Amen? Amen? Some of the people coming to us are already well-trained disciples, so God's going to take them a little bit higher. Others are coming with, they need more. They're like, I need more. They're going to get more. So it's all going to be good. We're super excited about it. But let me just tell you about the school real quick, in case you don't know. It's a full-time immersion experience for three weeks. It used to be a nine-month school. God told us to do a nine-month school, a three-week school, and a one-week school before we ever... Cheryl and I started leadership schools in uh, the year 2000, or 1999. So we started them almost 20 years ago. And our first one was then, and we did different versions. And then the next one, the next big one was in 2008, and we had a leader school where um, we had people come it was free. I think, where's uh, John Sorley? John, remember that school? John lived, was it 45 minutes away or an hour away? About an hour away. 
And we met every morning, Monday through Friday at 6 a.m. at Starbucks for an hour in the Word. And then we moved over to our office for an hour of prayer. Five days a week, an hour in the Word, hour in prayer. And then uh, several days a week, actually five days a week, we did outreach. So this school was crazy. We had classes, but they weren't the main focus. It was all about learn by doing. And it was a crazy school. We had 17 students, and um, it was life-changing. So it was very, very powerful. And so, but the, but the Lord began to speak to us about a school when we joined up with Heidi and Roland and Iris to start an Iris Leader School. And so we started that seven years ago, and uh, it's been amazing. It's been absolutely amazing. God's blessing and favor has been on it, and so we're in our seventh year this year. And uh, we, we've developed this three-week school as we've condensed our nine-month school because, again, because of the word of the Lord. And so we've got uh, Monday through Friday classes. Uh, we have 35 classes plus guest speakers. The reason we, reason we have 35 classes is we have seven areas of leadership that we're training people in. So there's five classes for each area of leadership. And then we also have crazy guest speakers. Michael Brodeur and David Wagner are coming along with Jake Hamilton. Uh, it's going to be pretty amazing. We have daily classes in intimacy. Uh, we have workshops, outreaches, connect groups so that the students stay connected. And um, it's a pretty cool thing. They're with us on Sunday morning. They're in a microchurch. And it's, it's pretty awesome. So uh, w this is significant because God told us to do this. It started with a word from the Lord. So we're in the middle of a prophetic fulfillment of the word of the Lord right now. And uh, Heidi actually prophesied over us. We're, the students will get to see that, I think, this evening. You get to see Heidi's word. But she's prophesied over us about the school and uh, given us several words in Mozambique and here about that. And um, we just know it's God. And so there's an there's a interesting regional word over the Central Coast about this is a place of rest and restoration and sending, equipping and sending. And so God has a call on the Central Coast for, for the very thing that we're doing. This school is a fulfillment of the regional word. And then it's a fulfillment of a specific word to this house, that we would be an Antioch sending station, an equipping and sending station, that people would go all over the world, that, that many of us have gone to various nations, but God would bring the nations to us. And so it's happening again this year, which is pretty awesome. Amen. What's really cool about that, too, is that everyday leaders, members of our house, are getting raised up and strengthened in their own leadership, which is awesome because that takes everything a little higher and it infuses a lot of life into our church. So how can we respond? What it is, uh, why this is significant, and then how you can respond, all right? First of all, there's 33 students. Uh, 17 are from everyday church. 16 are from other states and other nations. And so, first of all, just you guys, we're hosting these students. So that means not only are they staying in some of your homes, but it means lunches, breakfast, dinners, coffee, getting to know, hanging out with, praying for, blessing. So help us as we ask you every year and as you do such an amazing job, just help us host our amazing students. Um, be inspired by them and um, inspire them. And what's amazing is that some of them will be called by God. When, we, when Cheryl and I started the school, we didn't think anybody was going to stay because our whole goal was to send everyone. But it was odd to us, and then we started catching on that God brought people to actually stay. And so some of the ones that you are, have hospitality towards are going to end up staying. So let your hospitality be, in, be a welcome mat to the house and to the region, and we'll just see what God does. Amen? Does that sound good? Uh, by the way, the other thing, way you can respond is our guest speakers. So when, when David Wagner comes, he always comes with a word for our house. So I would encourage you when he comes to hear it as a word of the Lord to the house. And actually, Michael Brodeur, who's an apostolic teacher, does the same thing. He comes with a word. It comes in the form of a teaching. But really, receive those two in the spirit of a prophet, if you will, and you'll receive a prophet's reward. That's what the Bible says. So I want to encourage you, when we bring in guest speakers, we don't bring in as many now as we have. We've had... So we've had so many guest speakers in the past, but usually right now it's around our school time, and so um, really I want to encourage you to treasure this time and uh, benefit from it. And then please pray with us, serve with us. You know, some of I want to just thank all the everyday members that are serving. Some of you do meals for our students, and uh, you house students, and you pray for students. So please pray for our students. You saw that many of them are here already. There's some coming, arriving today and tomorrow. Amen. So, uh, so please help us with your hospitality, your prayers, your serving, your giving. 
Amen? This is a little different kind of message today. This is a coming attraction. So this is our first coming attraction. So I want to encourage you to wrap your hearts and minds around it and really, really own this. This is, this is a vision of the house, and it's a vision that we're walking in right now. The second thing I want to share with you is, is this series we're going to be doing called Preparing for Harvest. Matthew 9, 35 through 38 says, Jesus was going through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. He, he was healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Seeing the people, he felt compassion for them. Now, which people were these? These were the people outside the church. These were the people outside. He had his disciples. He was actually looking at all the lost people. And it says he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited. So they were basically in, in distress and discouraged. Like sheep without a shepherd. Now, I want you to hear this. Many of us think, this is an interesting thing. I was thinking about it during worship. But we think of shepherding as an in-house function, right? Like pastor, as you pastor people. But how do you know that Jesus is the good shepherd? And do you know that Jesus looked at the lost as those needing a shepherd? Think about that. We think, oh, the lost equals evangelist. Evangelists take care of the lost, then the pastors take care of the house. But that's not how Jesus does it. So the good shepherd doesn't just love the ones he has. You remember Jesus saying this? He said, he said, I have sheep that are not of this fold. I must go and get them and bring them in. I must enfold them. And so I want to encourage you that if you have a pastoral gift, if you, if you have an in-house gift, you're, you have a pastor-teacher gift, God wants you to take it outside the walls of the church. And I want to tell you how you do it. All you do is think family bigger. So this is family, and that's family. See, the way shepherds think is they think, Oh, God wants a big family, and some of the family members aren't here yet, so I'm going to go get them. So that's what Paul told Timothy when he said, do the work of an evangelist. So a pastor can do the work of an evangelist if you just think family and bigger. Think bigger family. God's a family God. Jesus is the good shepherd. They're sheep not of this fold that we must go get and bring them in. He actually told at the great banquet, he said, go and compel them to come that my house may be full, which is a pastoral function, right? Go pastors, go shepherds, and bring in the sheep so my house will be full. So how many of you know that we all get to participate in bringing in the harvest? You don't have to have a certain gift mix to participate in the harvest. God will use, if you have a pastoral heart, you're like, hey, I like one-on-one -on -one I don't really like to be a street event. Perfect. Be a good shepherd and go get the sheep. One-on-one. -on -one. Just do it through relational connection. Do it through coffee. Do it by inviting your neighbors over. Do it by ministering to felt needs. When somebody has a need, ask them if you can pray for them. You don't have to be an evangelist. You can just be who you are. Amen. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. So I want to encourage you to prepare for harvest first in our hearts. You know, and then also, you know, I'm a... I'm a, I would consider myself somewhat a prophetic person, but I've noticed in the prophetic that we're always waiting for the next thing, which is kind of the nature of the prophetic. Like, we're looking forward. What's you, what are you doing next, God? But Jesus said there's one area where you're not supposed to do that. Did you know it's in the harvest? Because in John 4, he said, some of you, you've heard it said four months, and then comes the harvest. In other words, You've been looking ahead, and what that phrase actually means in the vernacular, the idiomatic definition of that phrase is, why do today what you can put off until tomorrow? It actually is a procrastination phrase. Hey, the harvest isn't coming for four months. Chill out. Hey, the great harvest, the, the billion-soul harvest isn't coming right now, so just chill out. That's actually the spirit of that word. And Jesus said that's false. He said, look, look, see, I say something to you. The fields are white with harvest. I want you to see something. Everything's ready right now. Don't wait. And see, one of the great deceptions on the church, especially in the West, is that we're waiting for something. The gospel is clear. The, the great commandment, the great commission is clear. Go and love people and bring them into the kingdom. And we don't have to wait for anything. Now, can God do amazing outpourings in the future? Amen. That means, all that means is we go from fishing with a pole to fishing with a net. That's all that means. We just switch devices. But in the meantime, we get to fish. Because he said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. So there's not a period where he's like, hey, now's the time to be a fisher of men. No, no, that's what it means to be a disciple. Are we making sense here? 
So what we're going to do is we're going to have a seven-week teaching series after our two guest speakers. So uh, next two Sundays are going to be David and Michael speaking here on Sunday morning as well as in our school. And then after that, we're going to do a seven-week series on how we can practically prepare for the harvest. Okay, we're going to talk about exactly what we can do, not just conceptually like, hey, love the lost, but actual practical things that are attainable even if you don't feel very evangelistic, like things that you can do that are practical to start preparing for the harvest. Okay, so we're going to talk about that in this series, this seven-week series. And uh, we're going to talk about how to prepare on Sunday morning in our celebrations. We're going to make some changes to our building. We're going to do some things differently in our microchurches. We're going to do some things differently in how we serve. Like, it's going to be different because we're going to prepare for the harvest. So we've rolled out a welcome mat. Now we're going to roll out the red carpet. Does that make sense? So it, we're just going to take everything up a few notches. Why? Because we want to have the fruit of the harvest. We want Jesus to receive the reward of his, reward of his suffering. We want to bring in the harvest. We want to go for it. And so we love what we have. We're grateful for what we have. We're so thankful for this. But if you have an apostolic heart at all, this is never enough. So what we want to learn to do is be grateful for what we have, not be disdaining what we have. Thank you, God, for this. Now help us go get more. Amen? So that's what we're going to be doing. That's why it's so important. We're going to be receiving offerings because the, fi the, the harvest requires finances. We need to bring more people on the team. We need more facilities. We're birthing a store. We may birth a coffee shop. We're just, God is, God is on the move. There's lots of vision happening, but it just requires finances. And right now, we have more vision than finances. And how do you know that there's always provision for the vision? So, so we're going to be talking about that. What does it mean to finance a vision? All right? And um, I'm very excited about this. So one way that you can respond is make sure that you're here for this Preparing for Harvest series because I think it's important that we all move together, that our hearts are moved together because God wants to move us in the same direction. And, uh, you know, of course, join the team. If you're not serving now, serve, serve, and, uh, and give to it. As pray about how to give to that. Above and beyond normal tithes and giving, there's, there's sort of free will offerings that you can give and you can sow in. And we'll talk about some of those things more specifically to come. You guys good? Let me share two more preview, two more coming attractions. All right, what's the next one say? Anybody got a, oh, there it is, 2020 vision. Okay, now, I'm not very bright sometimes. I'm going to admit that. I'm just, I'm just saying I've got areas of brilliance right next to pockets of, what's the political correct way to say it? Kamala Harris just got in trouble for saying the R word. I have some issues, uh, learning issues. They might be learning disabilities, I'm not sure. It might be memory issues, I'm not totally sure, but I can have pockets of brilliance right next to very big challenges. And sometimes I don't pay attention to what's going on around me, and I, I think that I'm the one that thought it up. And in, in reality, other people are saying it, but the th cool thing is for me is because I'm not paying attention, it was unique to me. And so I heard, this, I heard this phrase, 2020 vision. I heard it from heaven. I didn't hear it from anyone else. And now everyone's like, oh, yeah, everyone's saying that. Lou Engle's saying that. Who? And I'm like, well, okay, but I didn't know that. I didn't copy them. You know those people that copy everyone? We don't do that here. But the Lord spoke to me that, that, that 2020 was a year of 2020 vision. And I got this picture that when you put on lenses, whether they're prescription sunglasses or glasses, I saw one lens was to see the community and the other lens was to reach the community. So I'm sort of, it's sort of piggybacking on prepare for harvest. 2020 vision is actually reaching, it's, getting, it's bringing in the harvest. So I feel like that the year 2020, so we're gonna prepare in this, in this coming fall, and I feel like there's gonna be a great harvest for us if we want it in 2020. There's an invitation to bring in lots and lots of lost people, lots and lots of prodigals, lots and lots of people that are broken, lots and lots of people that have been rejected by the church rejected by religion, and they're looking for a home, and we're it. God says you're it if you want to be. And I'm saying amen, yes, Lord. And I feel like there's an invitation for a, a massive harvest for real, for real. It's going to require some work. How many of you know that if you, get on a, if you want harvest, you've got to get in the fishing boat, and you've got to go catch some fish, and then once you catch them, you can't just party, you've got to clean them. 
there's some work involved in harvest. I, I uh, you know, I, I, when I was, I was taught that the church was the love boat. You remember the show, The Love Boat from the 70s? You know, it was this well-trained staff that took care of everyone's needs, sort of a consumer-oriented, you know, that the church was the love boat. Actually, the church is a fishing boat. And if you're on a fishing boat, have you know that you will pitch in? Or you'll get sent to the galleys. <laughs> you got to be a part of that. And so we, learn, we need to learn to see the community and reach the community. Why, is, why does this matter? It matters because we've been really, really good at seeing each other as family and seeing the nations. We've been good at each other, family, and nations, but not so good at seeing the community. Like most of us don't know who the mayors of the various cities are. Most of us haven't had a conversation with the fire department chief. We need to get involved in the cities that we live in, okay? And absolutely win win people to Jesus and win people even to friendship and to relationship. This 2020 vision concept is being said by other people, which means that God is saying it. It's, it's, it's being confirmed. In the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. I just heard Lou Engle. Lou Engle's an interesting barometer of uh, prophetic things. He gets very excited about things, and uh, I love Lou Engle. We've had him here, I think, three or four times, and it's, I felt like the Lord, we're supposed to have him in 2020, so I need to contact him and have him because I feel like he's going to help breathe on that. But uh, Jesus said, look, the fields are ready, and it's time to, to win the lost, to bring our neighbors, to uh, plant new microchurches. I feel like we're going to plant new microchurches. A lot of you don't know we have three different models for microchurches. We have a place microchurch, a people microchurch, and a passion microchurch. And so there a lot of you who maybe haven't felt qualified or ready to lead a place microchurch, which is what most of us, most of our microchurches are, you would be ready to lead a passion or a people microchurch. And so we're, we want you to do that. Like we need to plant a lot more microchurches. Why? Because we want to, it's Psalm 68, 6 says that he he gathers the lonely into family. He sets individuals into family. So with the wine, the outpouring of the reaching the lost needs to come the wineskin of family. And we're not simply wanting to, you know, the, the, the New Testament model is the big meeting and the small gathering in the home. Like that's, it has to be both. We need the tribal gathering for the inspiration and the collective worship and the giving and the, and the inspiration and the vision together. That's, this is absolutely part of how the early church operated. They had the big meeting. It happened to be mostly in the temple courts until they had actual facilities and like the school of Tyre and other places, but they weren't against buildings. It, that was never the issue. It was when the buildings caused people to become consumers. That's when it became an issue. And what happened in 310 AD is that the church became, Christianity became the state religion and churches became endorsed by the state, Constantine, and it caused a lethargy to set into the church because before they were persecuted, they were on the outside looking in of society and they knew, understood that they were here as pilgrims and aliens and strangers, but when they got the blessing of the state, everything changed. But it was, it was actually that mindset. It wasn't the buildings. that The buildings became a problem, but they weren't the problem initially. It was the mindset that shifted from, from a missional family to a consumer family. Hello? So we don't have to buy into that mindset. How many of you know that you can be a missionary right here on the Central Coast with all this stuff around us? You can leave this building as though it was transplanted in China or India or, or, or another nation and leave here and go, this is my mission field. You know, and the thing about this mission field, because there's some wealth here, is that people are wearing masks. Everything looks together. You know, you'll, you'll meet a couple that look totally together, and what they don't know is that their son is using heroin at the high school campus, and he's destroying his life. I've met dozens and dozens of these kids and their parents, and they have no clue what's going on. Or they're in major pain in their relationship, in their marriage, but they don't know who to talk to, and they've got, they've got to keep up good exteriors. And they're looking for somebody who has answers, who isn't afraid to become relational with them and begin to build friendship with them and begin to share with them the God that we know in terms that they can understand, getting rid of so much religious jargon and mumbo-jumbo and just telling them how it is in real terms. I want for us to become a house where addiction is broken. Amen? Amen. We want to start a we want to start a a real uh, a life recovery ministry here where we actually take the addicted and then we we become a place that they can come to. 
which will require some housing and some dads and moms, and it's going to require some infrastructure for sure. Uh, I'm not saying that ignorantly or lightly. We've been talking and praying about it for years, but I feel like it's time that we just absolutely need to become an answer for what's going on in society. So how can we respond? We need to ask God for ISAV, for our blindness, because to, because to reach the community, we have to see the community. And one of the main reasons we don't reach the community is we don't see them. We're just so anesthetized. We're inoculated. We've had a little bit of the antibody, and we're inoculated from the real thing. We don't see what's going on around us. We don't see the need. We're like, eh, okay, sirrah, sirrah, I'm okay, you're okay. And we just live in this culture where we think everything's okay, but it's not. Eternity is hanging in the balance. People's lives are hanging in the balance. We've had more crazy suicides even in our, that's affected us in the last few years than ever before. It's crazy what's going on right now. And who's addressing it? You know who's addressing it? Governmental, societal, and private organizations that are doing a way better job than the church. I praise God for those organizations, but don't you think we should do a better job? Yeah. That's our job. We need to step up. And it does require some work, and it does require some financing, and that's what God has called us to be and do is to be the answer for people's pain. Amen? Come on now. Even in the midst of our own stuff, can I just say, you don't have to abandon the quality of family to become outward. Like, we can still grow as family. You can still have stuff that you're working through. You can go to the harvest as a wounded warrior, and you'll get healed as you go. Like, I'm not talking about not taking no self-care. I'm just saying self-care has become the watchword for our society. Our self-care is so high, it's off the charts. Like we're so aware of every little owie, and we're not aware that there's major owies out there that are way bigger than our owies. Again, not to minimize our pain, but to just put things in perspective. Like I believe this scratch will get healed as I go, but somebody's lost a couple of legs out there and I need to help them triage them and not be worried about this scratch because actually my worried about this scratch is causing them to lose their life. Like, an, I'm not saying that in a guilt way, just saying in a smelling salts kind of way, like let's wake up. Let's ask God for ISAV to see what's going on around us. Can we do that? And lastly, I just want to say this, we need to believe that, and, and, and I believe this is a word of the Lord over the entire Western church, every member ministry. Like God wants to stop this you know, 22 football players on the field while 65,000 people watch and cheer and criticize. The church was never meant to be like that. The vast majority watching while the vast minority do all the work. It's never was meant to be like that. So there's going to be a, if you, if you like socialism, this is a good place to apply it. In the workforce, in the church, everybody does their part. Everybody has a place. Everybody serves. I know that's a hard word for you guys. I'm just kidding. Don't get political on me. I'm using it as an illustration. You look at Acts 4, and there was some pretty amazing distribution, and it was voluntary. It wasn't government-led. It was people caring for people. It was people getting involved and serving one another and bringing people into their homes. It wasn't legislated. It was volunteered by the Holy Spirit. And there's a move of God right now to, to finish the priesthood of all believers that was, that was actually released in the 1500s through Martin Luther. Like this thing is being fulfilled right now. Jesus is coming back for a church that's involved. He's not, there's, you know, the day of the superstar, the day of platform ministry, it's, this isn't platform ministry in that sense. I'm talking about that mindset, that thinking that we all come to see something happen. That's, that's over. This, this is a cheerleading moment for the actual army. I'm not, we are the army. Like, we're the army of God. And God is, it's, here's what it says in Ephesians 4. It's where he gave gifts to people, I'm summarizing, to equip the saints so they can serve. We are to grow up in all aspects into Christ as he fits the whole body together. And when we come together, there is supply. That's the, that's the point of Ephesians 4. Everything is supplied when we come together. As each individual works, as each person works, serves, sweats, the whole body is built up and strengthened in love. You see, as each one does his or her part, we are all strengthened in love. 
God, just make the church more loving. The answer that scripture says is everybody serves together. When we serve together, guess what happens? We rub shoulders and we don't like things about each other. And then we have to go to God and say, I don't like this person. They hurt me. They make me angry. They're frustrating. What do I do? And he says, more love. And we say, well, don't you have another answer? Like, can't you, can't you kick them out of the kingdom or banish them or anything or at least punish them? And no, I want you to love them more. Really? Yeah, that's how I do with you. Sometimes you bug me, saith the Lord. <laughs> but I still love you. So, so what ha- what's happening is we've just, we're just finishing up a restructuring of our team into five-fold ministries. So I don't know if you know this or not. I'm over the apostolic department. You should cheer for me at that point. Yeah. Just kidding. My wife Cheryl's over the prophetic department. Come away from. Danielle, where are you, Danielle? Danielle's over the evangelistic outreach department. Where's is Chuck here today? I didn't see Chuck. Okay, just clap as though he's here. Chuck's over pastoral department. And Rachel is over the teaching department. Paul, where's Paul? Abdu, I know this isn't the perfect introduction, but just bear with me. Wave your hand, Paul. Paul's our, now before you clap, listen, he's our development pastor part-time, and he's helping develop our staff and our goals to help us. So give Paul a hand. And then there's Rich. How do you describe Rich, really? How do you handle a problem like Maria? Rich. Rich pretty much runs the church. Rich has been promoted to executive pastor, which at this time is a lot of stuff that he probably doesn't like doing. But we have bigger plans for Rich, so this is just a season he's in. He's just getting the house in order right now. But he's your go-to guy for so many things because he's just so smart. It is frustrating to be on to be like a senior pastor and know that the guy next to me is smarter than me. (laughs) It it is. It's a little hard, you know. But I've I've had some years to work out, you know, those kind of issues. So I feel like with five more years of counseling, I'll have it. I'll I'll have it figured out, you know. But anyway, Rich, whatever. Hey, thanks for being so smart. Really, it's awesome. (laughs) Yay, Rich. So preparing for harvest can't happen unless we're all serving, honestly. It can't happen to the fullness of what God wants unless we're serving. It, it, it matters because it's the culmination. It's, it's really, it's the vehicle, if you will, for how this is all going to happen. Because we have vision that's bigger than our current workforce. So basically a bunch of you need, now what, I, will, I will give you an example. Have you noticed what Malachi and Melissa have been doing with worship? They've been expanding the worship team, Okay. So I know some of you may say, well, I sing worship and you haven't, it's okay, it's not against you. I'm just letting you know that there are so many people that are gifted with worship, but they're, they're expanding the team. Maybe not, maybe not everyone is involved, but a lot more people than used to be are involved, and it's because they have a vision for every member ministry, and they're implementing that, which is pretty awesome. Great job today, by the way, Lindsay and uh, <laughs> Kay- Kayla, wherever Kayla is. Kayla, that was awesome. And the whole team was awesome, did an amazing job. Something's really happening in worship, which is exciting. But I want to encourage you, uh, as far as every member ministry, to really know who you are, know your gifting. We've asked everyone to take the assessment at destinyfinder.com, which is a free assessment. <clears throat> and uh, just know, ask your friends, rate yourself in the fivefold, kind of know what your highest in that is of the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. You may not be those exact things, but just, you know, are you more apostolic than prophetic? Are you more prophetic than, than evangelistic, et cetera, et cetera? And just sort of know what that is because it'll help you know what departments to get involved in to be able to serve. So we want to make this as practical as we can. By the way, thank you for the 80 or 90 people that came to the five-fold meetings, which was amazing. Your names have been passed along to the appropriate department leader. 
But I want to encourage you, don't even wait for that. Like if you came to that meeting and you're, st you're wondering what the follow-up is, just make an appointment. Now that you know who the department leader is, make an appointment with the appropriate department leader and we're going to get you mobilized, okay? We're, we're in the midst of running the school and stuff, but we want you to have answers to know how to go forward, and so we want to help you with that. Amen? And, uh, you know, just kind of think about what your time commitment is. If it's, you know, a few hours a week, five, six, 10, 12 hours a week, that'll help us determine what role you can take, as well as if you feel called to be a team member versus a leader versus a manager. Those help us understand what capacity you'd like to function in and, um, and then, of course, what your gifting is. So let's keep going on that. Um, so those are some things that are coming. And I am excited about the coming attractions because I feel like what we're doing is trying to line up with what God is saying. Like our, the things that we're putting effort into are the things that we feel like the Lord is speaking to us. Does that make sense? And how many of you know that to be a leader, you have to be led? Like a good leader is led. And uh, so the Lord is the leader, right? And so we're under leaders, we're under shepherds, we're leading as he leads us. We don't lead through our own initiative, we lead as followers. And so a good follower makes a good leader. And we're trying to follow the lamb. And he's leading us in these areas. I believe actually that he's leading the larger body of Christ in these areas. And this is important because what's, what's happening right now is it's, it's global. You know, uh, my wife just got a word. My wife, how many of you know that she just got a job at, as an assistant manager in a store? And, uh, but it's, it's a fulfillment of a, I think Donna, you reminded her that it's a fulfillment of a word from, two, was it two years ago? about her working in the marketplace. and so, But she just got a word that there's going to be a real explosion of evangelism through the marketplace. So this whole thing of, you know, kind of being on church staff to do the ministry, is, is, it's, it's an old model. And I'm not saying that it's, you know, what I'm doing is the Lord had told me to do it, but it's not the norm. The norm is going to be people in the marketplace, you know, moms at home, loving their neighbor. That's, that's where the evangelism is going to happen. That's where the revival is going to happen. It's not going to be like it's been in the past. We, we think in terms of the past. We hear a term and we go backwards instead of forwards. Like we look at past tent revivals and we look at past healing evangelists and we think, well, that's what revival must look like. No, that's what revival did look like. But today there's a new era and it's the priesthood of all believers. And so God's going to do something in this apostolic age that we're in that's going to look different than previous revivals. It's going to be a little more of a, 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 a massive wave that's going to come through the various mountains of culture, and it's going to lead to the greatest harvest of souls we've ever seen. But I don't know that the church, if they stay in the building, are ever going to see it. And so there will be a missing group of people in the harvest, and it could be the most religious, which is a terrifying thought. Like, if you want to get where the action is, John Wimber used to say, the meat is in the streets. Like, John, I don't want the milk of the word. I want the meat of the word. And he said, well, the meat is in the streets. Like, it's doing, it's doing what Jesus said. It's not simply learning more and more. Most of us know enough to plant a 1,000 churches, honestly. We have enough knowledge to plant a 1,000 churches, probably most people in this room. And so I just want to encourage you not to stop learning, but to just keep, just apply as much as you can. Get it out as much as you can. Some of you have done ministries in the past. You know, I've seen it on your cards. You know, you've told me, listen, it's time to fire it up again or do something new, you know. But, but God used you for a purpose. Like, he used you because he wants to use you again in even greater dimension. And to take four or five with you and to make disciples as you do the work of ministry. Amen. Some of us are like, how do I make disciples? Disciples, start doing something and then bring people along for the ride. It's a great way to disciple. So here's what I do. I want to show you how I pray. Come with me. I'll meet you at 5 a.m. You can pray with me. And you'll teach someone how to pray. It's hard to do it through a manual when you can do it on your knees. So all of us are capable of making disciples. We just got to figure out what do I have that can be reproduced in others and then do that. Amen? Amen.